In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here in Massachusetts, we have the Requiem Mass. And some very good news this morning. Some good Catholic soul in uh, Rome went into the church and took the idols, at least three, or th- three of them, I think, and threw them in the Tiber River where they belong. So I'm sure you all agree with me. We would love to congratulate this, this fellow, whoever it was, and may Our Lady bless him. This is the kind of action now that only speaks. And, uh, of course, we must storm heaven with the daily rosary and begging Our Lady to hasten the hour when her triumph will come, when God will give us, finally, a good Pope, A good Pope who will set things straight and bring things back to tradition. And this was the guiding light of Our Lady of Fatima. But in Our Lady, all the apparitions of the Virgin Mary that are approved, they all speak of our times. These dark times. These uh, apostate days where man is enthroned in the place of God. And it's very visual, it's, it's audio-visual. The new Mass says it all. It faces man. Man is in the middle. The tabernacle is thrown into some corner. And so, uh, let's look back, back in history, because the Church has been through many storms before. Here's what G.K. Chesterton says, about the time after the barbarians invaded Rome. Rome was sacked, and it was run over by barbarians. Rome was run over by barbarians coming in. At that time, women were running into politics, which is a sign of decadence, and and then all kinds of corruption the vomitoriums, birth control, killing of the young, complete sensualism, and God punished. So St. Gregory the Great says, When we consider the way in which other men have died, we find relief in thinking about the type of death that is threatening us. What mutilations... What cruelties have we not seen inflicted upon people for which death is the only cure and in the midst of which life is a torture? So St. Gregory describes the church in his time as a ship full of holes and sinking. Here's what G.K. Chesterton says. The idea that Christianity belongs to the Dark Ages. Here I did not satisfy myself with reading modern generalizations. I read a little history. I found that Christianity was the one path across the Dark Ages that was not dark. It was a shining bridge connecting two shining civilizations. So to be historically accurate, the Dark Ages was was at the fall of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the spreading of the Catholic faith and the Catholic nations. So he says, If anyone says that the faith arose in ignorance and savagery, the answer is simple, it didn't. The faith arose in the Mediterranean civilization in the full summer of the Roman Empire. The world was swarming with skeptics, and pantheism was as plain as the sun when Constantine nailed the cross to the mast. It is perfectly true that afterwards the ship sank, but it is far more extraordinary that the ship came up again. But it was repainted and glittering, with the cross still at the top. This is the amazing thing that religion did. It turned a sunken ship into a submarine. The ark lived under the load of waters after being buried under the debris of dynasties and clans. We arose and remembered Rome. 
The most absurd thing that could be said of the church is the thing we have all heard said of it. How can we say that the church wishes to bring us back into the dark ages? The church was the only thing that ever brought us out of them. And what about the church brought civilization from the devastation of the barbarians and the immorality and the chaos and the rocking of all political dynasties? It was the Catholic Church to shine. And what was it about the Catholic Church? Everything Archbishop Lefebvre has handed down to us and all the good popes, the mass of all time, the faith of all time, the unchanging Catholic faith, and then all the seven sacraments untouched by new rites, and of course, all that comes with it, the ceremonies, the devotions, especially to the Mother of God, to all the saints, and the Catholic life, the Catholic way of life. And that includes down to the very basics of men being men, women being women, and dressing like them. Remember what God says, is an abomination in my eyes that a woman dresses like a man, and a man dresses like a woman. So, what happened? The spread of the Catholic faith from the year about the 400s, so towards the end of the great Roman martyrs, so 313, Constantine uh, put out the Edict of Milan, that Catholicism was considered the state religion. And it was the end of the gladiatorial games, and the faith began to spread. And on whose shoulders did it spread? The Catholic, good Catholic bishops and good Catholic priests. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre understood this time right now, the way to rebuild for the future is form good Catholic priests. On whose shoulders is brought the sacraments, the preaching of the faith, the combating of heresy and error. So let's look at a summary of this. During the long night from the 5th to the 10th centuries, an age of iron, lead, and darkness, the Church achieved the baptism of the barbarian races. Thanks to the lucid intelligence and steadfast endurance of devoted bishops, the sweat and blood of pioneering Celtic and Benedictine monks, and the lives spent in prayer by silent hermits. In the year 496, St. Remy, Bishop of Reims, baptized Clovis, king of the Franks, the Frankish Empire. In 500 AD, St. Avitus, bishop of Vienne, friend and mentor of Sigismund, the king of the Burgundians, received him along with thousands of his warriors, as was the mindset of the barbarians, were received into the Catholic Church, baptized. In the year 575, St. Columbus, Columbanus and the Celtic monks disembarked on the shores of Brittany and like flashes of lightning crossed France and traveled up the Rhine into Switzerland then went over the Alps into northern Italy preaching founding abbeys and revitalizing the local churches in southern France Saint Martin of Tours established monasteries he cut down one of the trees of the pagans with Pope Francis. They're planting pagan trees and bowing before them. I hope that guy who threw them in the river goes to that tree and uproots it also. We will applaud him. But St. Martin cut down the tree and the tree fell and that didn't convince him. So St. Martin ordered the tree, showed them the true God, and the tree went up on its own and fell to the other side. And he stood on the stump and held up the crucifix okay. and preached the true religion. St. Martin of Tours in southern France. In Spain, the magnanimous Visigoth martyr prince, St. Hermenegild, mm -hmm. and Bishop St. Leander of Seville, were instrumental in the conversion of the Visigoths under King Ricared I in the year 589. So the four, five, six hundreds, seven hundreds are all 
the spreading of the Catholic faith throughout Europe, but back to what it was, the faith, our catechism, the Mass, the true seven sacraments. It's exactly what Archbishop Lefebvre gave to us, what the Church has always handed down to us. Nothing novel, no changes of the sacraments, no new Mass, but the same faith, the same Mass. To England, in the year 597, St. Gregory the Great sent the Roman monk St. Augustine of Canterbury. Within five years, King Ethelbert of Kent and several thousand Saxon warriors begged for baptism. The Lombards converted between the years 653 and 700. St. Boniface and the Benedictine monks reinvigorated the Frankish church and began fostering the conversion of the Saxons and the Frisians of Germany and the Netherlands from 716 to 754. Then came that so-called Indian summer of the restoration of the Western Roman Empire, transformed through the idealism of Charlemagne, who held as his ideal the Catholic city, the spreading of the faith and the monasteries. He would call the monasteries the joyful Catholic schools for the boys. The joyful Catholic schools. And the nuns spread everywhere, also teaching the girls. This was big under Charlemagne. And the establishing of Gregorian chant everywhere, uniting the whole kingdom in the Holy Roman Catholic Mass. Alcuin, A-L-C-U-I-N, he's not canonized yet, but he was a great monk and priest and others into an, changed the Roman Empire into the Imperium Christianum, the Christian Empire, the Catholic Empire, where Christ the King was acknowledged and adored. Saints Cyril and Methodius evangelized the Slavs of Moravia what? and Russia, starting in the year 862. On September 11th, 1910, the reforming abbey of Cluny, of Cluny in Burgundy, France, was founded. And by the 12th century, it headed a vibrant order of over 300 monasteries, a powerful source of renewal for Catholicism. There were so many monks in Cluny, they had what was called the uh, Laus Perennis, the continual chanting of the divine office. They had to go in shifts. So every minute of the day, there was some. There were monks in the chapel chanting the office, and then the next shift would come in. The uh, shift would go out to go to the fields and work. The new shift would come in. Incredible. The North was impenetrable for centuries due to the hostile Vikings, who inspired such terror that Catholics of the ninth century added a prayer to the Litany of the Saints, which said. A furore normanorum libera nos domine, from the fury of the Northmen, deliver us, O Lord. Finally, one missionary succeeded, the Apostle of the North, St. Ansgar, in the year 801 to 865. His name means God's javelin, St. Ansgar. He penetrated deep into the Norse territories of Denmark and Sweden, using Hamburg as his headquarters. A bold and tenacious individual, he journeyed without any support from Frankish arms, constantly uncertain of the attitude of the Norse kings, who wavered between tolerance and persecution. Time and again, St. Ansgar met defeat, even the destruction of Hamburg by the Norwegians in 845. But eventually, St. Ansgar succeeded in setting up a beachhead at Birka on Lake Malaren, where the small group of converts included the Swedish king's Stuart Hergir. By the year 1080, when King Inge wrote to Pope Gregory VII, asking for the establishment of two episcopal sees in his nation, Sweden was well on its way to becoming Catholic. To Iceland, Catholics arrived in 874, since at least 40 of the original 400 Viking settlers from Norway under 
Inglefer Arnarsson included Irish Catholic slaves. Later, from 1000 to the year 1050, large-scale conversion of the Icelanders occurred. In the 14th century, the rim of Christendom extended to include Finland, thanks in no small way to the missionary efforts of the Dominican priests. Finally, by around 1450, Lithuania also had become part of the Christian Empire. In 988, under St. Vladimir of Ukraine, his whole country became Catholic and were baptized. St. Stephen of Hungary, 960 to 1050, in the Hungarian tribes. In Moravia, or rather the Croatians, influenced by St. Cyril and Methodius. And cannot forget St. Patrick in Ireland, 440 to 493, driving out all the snakes. So the whole spread of the faith, St. Olaf in Norway, and St. David in Wales in the 500s, the whole spreading of the Catholic faith. Here's what one historian said about this era. It was as if the world had shaken herself free, cast off her old age, and were clothing herself everywhere in a white garment of churches. The white garment of the Catholic faith, which spread everywhere. During the 5th through the 7th centuries, due to the absence of the political, legal, and military stability of the Roman Empire, remember the Roman Empire was shaken and overcome, Western European society resembled a ship on unknown seas, lashed by high waves. The church, led by the Catholic priesthood, was the only institution capable of taking command of the rudder, and navigating because only she knew the direction the ship should be taking to reach a haven of social order. And that social order is exactly the same as what the church has always upheld and Archbishop Lefebvre handed down to us, the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only the Catholic Church had the navigational maps with the knowledge, laws, and traditions from the old world that had disintegrated. She alone had the vision of history in the light of eternity, and especially the supernatural strength that inspired the stamina necessary to continue at the helm through the long night of centuries during which the storm continued. The priesthood alone, according to both barbarians and Romans, was surrounded by the aura of both religious and intellectual authority as well as by ancient Roman grandeur, because Catholic priests were not only the solitary mediators of the sacred, but were also the dispensers of Roman law and the holders of the texts of Greco-Roman culture. In this way, the church, led by the priesthood and the monks, had the wherewithal to unite the different peoples of the West within a common culture that would be born from their conversion to the Catholic faith. So, you have a Catholic culture, and what's the root word of culture? Now we have a culture of death, abortion, euthanasia, contraception, and every invented way, now assisted suicide, and now the legalization of marijuana everywhere, which kills the will, makes men into noodles. Mm -hmm. So we have a culture of death, but the Catholic culture is vibrant, strong, robust, full of life, humble, because it adores Christ the King, yet strong against error and heresy and the Muslim invasions. So it's the Catholic faith that the root word of culture is cultus. In Latin, cultus means worship. It comes from the Latin word colo colere, which means to plow the field, to plow the field. And what plows the field, what plants the seed and plows the field, Christ is the grain of wheat that died in the field and burst forth into a new tree bigger than all the rest. This is the Catholic faith. Jesus Christ, his kingship, his sacraments, his faith, his catechism, his mass of all time. 
So culture is centered on how we adore God. So in this devastation we are in, worse than the barbarians who came into Rome, our, our age is much worse. At least the barbarians were manly and not trying to be girls. And their girls, the women of the barbarians, were women, feminine. And they weren't trying to be men and go into battle with their barbarians. They didn't want to be in battle. They knew their place. They knew their place. So the true culture is centered on the mass and the Catholic faith. So on our shoulders, you Catholics of tradition and priests faithful to tradition, on our shoulders is everything to rebuild for tomorrow. But because we're so crippled, because we're so twisted, because nature has been so uh, damaged by the modern philosophies and people don't know what to think straight anymore, people don't know what's, what's up or down anymore, what's true or false anymore, what's good or bad anymore, so we're, we're so lost at sea that God has given his mother for our time. And maybe it's a lot safer than many bishops and priests because it's the Blessed Virgin. And that's, she's our refuge now. She's our strength now. She's our guide now. And that's a great thing. Thank God. <laughs> because she did promise through her rosary and scapular, we're going to win. We're going to win conquering under her banner. We're going to defeat the enemies under her heel. And she's going to smash the captain of this whole Masonic, Judaic overthrow of our Catholic Church. She's going to smash the serpent's head. So, Our Lady is the one. And she said these words to Blessed Alan de la Roche a Dominican priest, a great spreader of the rosary. She said, I want people who have a devotion to my rosary to have my son's grace and blessing during their lifetime and at their death. And after their death, I want them to be freed from all slavery so that they will be like kings wearing crowns and with scepters in their hands and enjoying eternal glory. That's the plan of Our Lady for those who are close to her. So the victory is ours. Whether we live to see her victory on earth, we may or may not, God knows. But certainly when we die, she wants us in heaven. She wants us to reign with her son in the glory of heaven. So listen again to these great words of Archbishop Lefebvre. In his letter to the Friends and Benefactors, April 1980, it applies very much to our time now. We must refuse to compromise with those who deny the divinity of our Lord. Now, Pope Francis was accused of this by, uh, by one of his atheistic journalists. I hope it's not true, but I'm, I'll tell you what, if any of us were accused of denying our Lord, that he was God, we would make sure loud and clear that there was no mistake. We profess him as God. So Pope Francis is silent for some strange reason. We must refuse to compromise with those who deny the divinity of our Lord or with any false ecumenism. We must fight against atheism and laicism in order to help our Lord to reign over families and over society. We must protect the worship of the Church, the cultus, which is the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass, and the sacraments instituted by our Lord, practicing them according to the rites honored by twenty centuries of tradition. Thus we will properly honor our Lord, and thus be assured of receiving His grace. It is because the novelties of Vatican II which have invaded the church since the council, diminish the adoration and the honor due to our Lord and implicitly throw doubt upon his divinity that we refuse them. These novelties do not come from the Holy Ghost, nor from his church, 
but from those who are imbued with the spirit of modernism and with all the errors which convey this spirit condemned with so much courage and energy by Pope St. Pius X. This holy pope said to the bishops of France with regard to the Sion movement, the true friends of the people are neither revolutionaries nor innovators, but the men of tradition. The true friends of the people are the Catholic men of tradition. So stay in the battle line of all the saints, of all the martyrs, the same faith, the same mass, the same seven sacraments, the same rosary in our hand, because we're going to win. Our Lady will have the victory. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. It's not through innovation, not through revolution of the world, but the revolution of the gospel, as Archbishop Lefebvre called it, the revolution of Christ the King. And that's the revolution Our Lady's preparing now to overthrow this atheistic system of Vatican II and the ap apostasy of the nations and bring back the reign of her divine son. Hasten, O Blessed Mother, thy sweet hour of thy great victory. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.